Hey guys, so from the Soldier Spot here, uh, I'm sharing with you today this presentation that I put together a few years ago. And the reason why I'm sharing it is because as I sit in a leadership position and I do NCOPDs with my soldiers quite often, this is a highly requested topic of just investment strategies and uh, what I do. And just to give a little bit of my background as to why I do this and why people do find this interesting is I am 12 years into the Army now as a medic. And at this point in my career, I'm completely debt free. I achieved that status uh, about a year ago now. And my investment portfolio and net worth is over 100000 at this point across a few different things. So I'm not going to really break that down and go into my um, investment portfolio strategies and exactly where I go, but rather in this presentation, I'm just going to go over some general awareness to help you achieve that same thing. Uh, this is completely free. It's just to help out military members and anybody else who is interested in this information. So let's go ahead and get started. This presentation is uh, done on Prezi, so if it looks a little bit different than you've seen before, that would be why I really do like this platform. Not, uh, not sponsored or anything, but um, so investment strategies here. And to start off with, I am not a financial advisor at all. Research all investment information on your own to determine your own strategy. Move into the problem here. So the main problem that we have is that our school system does not help with financial literacy. Financial literacy is completely different and that's something that you have to go in search of on your own. That originally started through the Rockefeller family as well as the Carnegie's and you can see a quote right there directly from John D. Rockefeller I don't want a nation of thinkers, I want a nation of workers. So being one of the richest men in the world at that point and needing a very large workforce, that's what he aimed the school system towards. He wanted the school system to shape people to be workers and not thinkers, people who could take essentially his wealth and his position, but rather people who would add to his wealth and position. So the Rockefellers and the Carnegie families invested significantly in the public school system and created the General Education Board in 1902. They have a long history of uh, dumping lots of funds into the General Board of Education and uh, changing curriculum to their benefit to either benefit uh, you know, the mindset that is required for them to stay on top and run their businesses or to benefit the products that they sell. So uh, the income school systems teach you to earn is the W-2 1099 income and is the highest taxed type of income that is available in America. That is why financial literacy is so important. Something that the school system does not talk about it, and that is a big portion of why is because the influencers that pay that, and the Rockefeller and Carnegie families are still alive and pushing, uh, pushing their efforts today. So financial literacy is within reach, but it's out of touch for most people. The public school system wasn't designed to create financially literate people. That's a problem. Moving into that piece there, the purpose of public education and all of this is pulled from background um, sites, which I usually cite right here. So purpose of public education to prepare students for college, prepare students for the workforce, working those 1099 jobs, W-2 jobs, which most people fit into and help children fulfill their uh, diverse potentials. So preparing students for college then starts student debt, which just gives somebody else more money. Preparing students to work in, a, in the regular workforce to work a W-2 or 1099 job allows for the highest taxed type of income to be available to give somebody else more money. So that is what the school system is designed around. So those two of the three tenants that they that the National School Board Association, that's where I pulled that information from, 
two of three of those are directly used to put you in a work mindset, to work for somebody else and to give income to somebody else instead of making it and obtaining it, keeping it for your own. School system teaches that you must trade your time for money. A lot of people don't know what passive income is. They don't teach passive income. Instead, they teach that you have to trade your skills or time for money, directly for that money. And that is not efficient. That is not the best way to live, but that is what we're taught from very early on. It does not teach you how to create that passive income, which we'll talk a little about uh, in here. So the first one, the first section that we're gonna go to here is the cash flow quadrant. This cash flow quadrant is, uh, as you can see, that little box that's right up there. This is one that comes from Rich Dad series by Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, so the whole series uses that cash flow quadrant. And a lot of the information that I'm going to be uh, going over here comes from that Rich Dad series. And uh, a lot of it actually comes from a very specific book by Tom Wheelwright, which is Tax-Free Wealth. So I already own my own business here, uh, whether it's DIY with Chris or The Soldier Spot um, that you're seeing this on. That is why I started reading that book, uh, to, to help me understand how I could utilize my business to its maximum potential to be taxed less legally and uh, keep, keep money where I want it to be. But it is also that book, if you want to read it, is, is very interesting and helps you as just somebody working that 1099 or, or W-2 job. It still allows you to understand where the government puts its priorities and what what the tax rates are for different things and where maybe you should prioritize um, your efforts in your life in order to capitalize on that for yourself. Over 5,800 pages of tax laws, it says right there, and this is a direct quote from that book, but only 30 of those pages are devoted to raising taxes. All the rest of them are lowering or giving tax exemptions. If you have a CPA, I would ask them about this. I do want to forewarn you, though, that I've interviewed several CPAs at this point, and they really don't like that interview, particularly when I ask questions like this. Like, hey, are you guys familiar with the tax code? Well, yes, we're, we do taxes, right? <laughs> and so I will ask, you know, well, okay, of the tax code, how much of the tax code uh, generally is aimed towards raising taxes or lowering taxes or giving tax exemptions. And that question in itself, they have no idea how to answer it. And as I try and rephrase it and, and really try and um, readdress that question to a way that they can understand it better, they just get more and more frustrated. And generally, there is no understanding. So I usually point it out. I'm like, hey, you know, out of that manual that is huge, that 5,800 pages uh, approximately, there's only about 30 just towards raising. So what can you do for me as a CPA? What is your knowledge of the tax code and how can you help me reduce or find those tax exemptions for my business or, or my personal life? So if you do ask that question, just be prepared for your CPAs to not be very happy with you. Maybe unless you have a, a lot bigger business than I do and a lot more money on the line. <laughs> um, but yeah, that has not went over so well in, in the CPAs that, that I have interviewed. They, they don't like that at all. So we have the, the cash flow quadrant right over there. And another quote from Robert Kiyosaki is a boy, thanks to my rich dad. And if you're not familiar with the Rich Dad Poor Dad series, his poor dad is his dad, his biological dad, who doesn't have good investment strategies and financial literacy. And then he has a friend, which is referred to as his rich dad, and that rich dad had very good investment strategies and taught Robert Kiyosaki a lot of the information um, that he has to this day early on in his life and those different strategies. So as a boy, thanks to my rich dad, 
I knew that those in the E and S quadrants paid the highest percentage in tax. I also knew that those in the B and I quadrants paid the lowest percentage, sometimes zero in tax rates. So when I keep on saying the 1099s and W-2 jobs are the highest taxed, it's those two cash flow quadrants. The employee, which is the E, and you can see these over here on the right hand side, the E is employee and that is your W-2 jobs and it's it's the highest taxed. Then there is the self-employed, which is where I'm at right now. And uh, a lot of my income comes from 1099s and 1099s are still taxed highly. But I, in this category, in self-employed, still have a lot more tax exemptions than the E. So the E section here, which is what most people are in, and this is the very specific box that our school systems actually teach you to work in. They don't teach you to work in any of these other boxes. So they teach you to work in this one, in the employee section. And that's the highest tax with the least amount of exemptions that you have available to you. Start shifting to some of these other areas, there are more exemptions that are available to you. We'll start going into some of the exemptions that are available based on these two. And really we're just gonna go into the employee and then the big business to cover both sides of the quadrants. We'll start here in employee. A table here that goes over taxable income for employees, uh, individuals. Some of the things that apply to employees. High government insurance taxes that are taken out of your pay. Social security tax. You have to report everything when you're filing your taxes on your Schedule C. Personally liable for all risks. Anything you do, you are responsible for that. Pays the maximum amount of social security tax and maximum amount of Medicare tax. The only deductions that are available to you right off the bat are mortgage interest, property taxes, and charitable donations. These are your main ways of driving down your taxes. For big business, this is the other side. And a lot of this, uh, a lot of these deductions also apply if you run your uh, business appropriately as like an LLC, sole proprietor, um, side. So it does apply to to sole owners as well, but uh, is much more applicable to big businesses. You own your own practice when you have that. This files its taxes separately for those returns. Earnings can be paid as distributions and are not subject to employment taxes. That's one way of uh, avoiding taxes legally. Not liable for employer partner mistakes. So as an individual, if I have a sole proprietorship or an LLC and insurance on it, even if I'm the sole proprietor, the only person working for the company, just because I do something wrong, if I mess up, say, so if I do my DIY stuff and I were to go do some work on somebody's house, if I were to mess up as an individual because of my knowledge or, or just whatever I did, then I can be held liable for that or the company can be held liable for that individually it doesn't cross over to both so even though i'm the only member in it if i have it set up the right way then only one or the either one or the other gets held liable for that action the business or the individual themselves and that can really help protect your money as you start growing only salary is subject to employment taxes as you're pulling that from your big businesses as, as an owner. And you can avoid most, if not all, government insurance and social security taxes. You pass that on to the people who work for you. They pay those taxes, but we're not. Deductions. A pretty big list there of, of deductions. That is why when you're looking at people who have large businesses and lots of money, May not may may not pay as many taxes as you do in who are who may be somebody in a lower tax bracket. That is why they're finding more exemptions to drop down the cost that they have to pay taxes on. So those are all different examples right there uh, that can drive down those costs. Cash flow quadrant. Next thing that we're going to go into is Dave Ramsey's baby steps. So we're talking about two completely different programs here. A little bit of Dave Ramsey baby steps, financial freedom stuff, and then also 
uh, Robert Kiyosaki, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad stuff. So the baby steps to financial freedom uh, are six different steps that you can use to mainly get out of debt. The primary purpose of that is to figure out how to get out of debt. And then uh, the end, the last steps, the latter of the steps will teach you how to invest, uh, how much to invest and whatnot. It's just a general guide that you can follow. So the two, the, the two different sections we're going to cover here is the budget and investing. We'll head into budget here, your monthly budget to dedicate funds for investing in the baby steps. If you haven't done a budget, if you haven't looked at all of the costs that you have incurred, if you haven't looked at your bank account and, and seen where all your money is going, what is it, it is a gal what it is allocated to, uh, and really budgeted it, then you're probably losing out on a lot of information and not completely understanding where you can cut back or where you can divert some of your time, energy, efforts, and money to reducing your debt and then investing it appropriately. So here's just a, a couple different pictures, examples of different budgets that you can use. Uh, there's plenty free budgets that are available all over online. Uh, so super easy to do. Even if you have Microsoft Office, you know, if you pull up in a, a new Excel document, then there's lots of personal budget Excel documents that are available for you as well. So very easy to get your hands on. Uh, usually there's a fair amount of people who will also help you do basic budgeting and literacy education for pretty cheap. So get your budget done, put a thousand dollars, use that budget to find that extra money, put a thousand dollars into an emergency fund. That's just your base step. Then start using, uh, after that thousand dollars is, is in there, use whatever money you were putting into that thousand dollars in an emergency fund and use it to start paying off of uh, paying off your debt snowball. The debt snowball uh, through his program says that you should be taking the the card or the balance that is the lowest, whatever your lowest balance. So it's not going off of the interest rate, it's going off of your lowest balance. Taking that and starting with it, pay it off, pay off whatever your lowest balance is. Then take that money that you would have owed on that low balance item and use that to start paying off your next lowest balance and your next lowest balance and just keep on using that. And every time you pay something off, take that money that you were using to pay that and dump it on the next thing. So using the debt, small, uh, debt snowball to pay off debt. Baby step number three, three to six months of expenses in savings. So expenses, whether that's your mortgage, food, uh, cell phone bill, internet, gas, groceries, whatever it may be, take three to six months of that and put it in your savings. That is part of your emergency fund to help you stay afloat if something bad happens. Baby step number four, five, and six. You can see that there's an asterisk there. That's because there are areas of deviation across different investors. So I'm part of a few different everyday millionaire investment groups on Facebook and follow some people on YouTube as well. And this is where people start to disagree a bit is on baby steps four, five, and six. What the percentage is that you're gonna be investing, where you wanna invest it into, um, your diversity, a lot of different people have their, have different opinions there, but just following his baby steps, what they are is the invest 15% for baby step four, invest 15% of all household income into Roth IRAs and retirement. Baby step five, pay off your home early. And baby step number six, build wealth and give to charity, give to whoever you want. A big area that people don't agree on here is so saying, uh, essentially saying paying off your home early or even completely paying off debt early. Where other people think um, or deviate from these steps is they say, well, okay, 
I owe $20,000 on my car and I happen to come across $20,000 cash right now and I have the ability to pay off the car, what is the interest rate that I'm paying on that, on my car loan? If my interest rate is pretty low, say I bought a new car and I was able to get really good interest, interest rate of 5% or so, but I can take $20,000, that same amount that it would take to zero out that loan, and I can invest it at a higher return rate, guaranteed return rate, say 15%, 10%, 8%, whatever it may be, if I can guarantee a higher return on my investment for that $20,000, why wouldn't you put that $20,000 somewhere in an investment account that would give you a higher return than what you're even paying on that car loan? If you just zero out all of your money and now you have zero debt, that's really cool. But if you just zero out your money, you're still not using that. You're, you're not getting anything back for the money that you have. So that is something that that people do talk about. I'm not saying I agree with it at all. Uh, a lot of that comes down to like risk and whatnot. You really have to be sure of what you uh, are investing in to make sure that your uh, return on investment is much higher than what you're currently paying on your car. But that is a big point of deviation across investors with these baby steps. Moving on here to the investments, uh, investment tips. So business tax strategy, from a business perspective, uh, protect your LLC and grow levels of your business. So that's these two little videos here. I can't play them here. These are just screenshots. But these are both from uh, this guy on TikTok at Vanitor. Um, and he goes over these really, really cool information uh, that is available here. And, and this is all free just, just by talking to people who are financially there and really trying to spread that knowledge and wealth. So have a business, protect it with an LLC, earn to pay for the expenses with your business to offset your income. So take things that you would be doing regularly, say your business buys your car and you start using your car because you drive to work every single day and you're, and you're a sole proprietor, then you start using the things for that car, the expenses for that car, and you can start deducting them for your business. Talk with your CPA, talk with your uh, tax professional. Um, that's, that's my limited knowledge. Talk with them to make sure that you're absolutely square on that, but that's something that you can use to offset your income. Invest your excess income that is available because you just got rid of that offset. So if I uh, start, if I sell my vehicle to my business and I did owe a, uh, if I was still making payments on that and they take over the payments for it essentially, now I have whatever that payment was, two, three hundred, five hundred dollars a month that I can start investing. That, is, that excess income, because I diverted it over to the business, I can start investing that somewhere else. Buy everything with a business to deduct income, and everything there is in quotation marks because it does not mean everything that you have and own, but within the business realm, buy as much as you can with, with your business that is required for the business to be legal to deduct the income that is available. So that's how taxes at the end of the year work for these businesses is they can say, hey, well, we made $100,000 this year in profit. Well, what are our deductions and exemptions? If we have exemptions, those come off first. So we have a $10,000 exemption for whatever it may be. Cool, now I only have to pay taxes on 90,000 instead of 100. So even though I made $100,000 profit, I only have to pay taxes on $90,000 of that. And then you have your deductions that come in. And so if you're deducting things like your business trips, the things that you're buying, the other expenses, the um, uh, paying employees or contractors, whatever it may be, those are all deductions and they're going to continue coming off of that $90,000. And if you do it right, if you're smart about it and you do it legally, 
then you can drive that all the way down to where you are paying less, you are paying in a, in a smaller tax bracket than somebody who works that W-2 uh, job that, that makes less than your business did. But you can pay less in taxes because of that. You can employ your children and pay them up to $12,000 a year tax-free income for them. Uh, recommendation is to put it in a Roth IRA so you get that com compound interest and then they can just, it keeps all of that money within your family and it helps your children be set up for success as they start getting older. So easy way to deduct income there. Spend more than half of your time on a vacation doing business uh, doing business stuff. So whether that's uh, running your website, doing blog stuff, going out and doing research. Um, an experience that they had shared in the book was somebody who's into real estate investing. And so they wanted to go on vacation to Florida, say. And they're like, okay, well, maybe I want to buy a house in Florida. And so they schedule their trip to Florida and while they are in Florida doing whatever they want to do on vacation, if they spend more than half of their time, and that is uh, regular eight hour work days, to my understanding, four of those eight days at eight hours a day doing business, then you can deduct the entire trip. So the plane tickets, the food, everything that the hotel can all be deducted because it turned into a business trip. And then claiming depreciation assets is something that is huge. So if you did sell or if your business bought a car, then they can claim depreciation on that items. And that goes over a series of years. Talk with your CPA for that. They have better understanding of, of what of how many years that takes, uh, but they take a percentage of the overall price and they deduct it each year. So if I uh, could deduct or my depreciation was $20,000, but it was over uh, five years, then okay, I made $100,000 this year. Well, there's $20,000 right off. And next year, even if I didn't make as much or say I made more, that's still another $20,000 just right off the bat. I don't even have to spend that 20 on, on that particular year. You could, you could make more money and you still have that immediate $20,000 depreciation that is available for that year. So some cool diagrams here that, that show different ways of kind of funneling your, your money. Um, so right here it's showing the individual Evan right there as the business owner, Evan has a has a few different businesses he owns here. So he has the LLC, which is the S Corp up top, and then he has three individual LLCs or, or two LLCs and then a partnership, right? So the LLC, the S Corp is a holding company, as it says right there. It holds all of the money from every single, from all four of these entities essentially. But for the most part, the S Corp isn't making any money. It's these three down here. So these three different things, LLC number one sells a product, LLC two sells a different product, and then the, part, and the partnerships is services, so you can have contractors and whatnot working there. All three of these different organizations make money. They then give all of their money to the holding company who may manage, say, the uh, appointments or how the marketing, how all this works, they may manage everything that way. So all the money is given to them. And so the LLC, that S Corp, is your holding company for all the funds that are available. Then Evan being the business owner, and this is just one guy essentially working, doing this whole thing, and can draw a salary, which is taxed, to himself and he can also draw distributions, which is not. So that is, he, you can pull two different um, forms of income right there to, your, to, your, to yourself and get all of these deductions for this process. So this is a really good setup after you get more developed and going. Uh, and then you also have this one over here from the same guy 
Level one, when you're very first starting up your business, the, the most important thing is to separate your personal account and your business account. So level one uh, business, when people are first starting off, is usually any sales that are made funnels right into their personal account. That is a big no-no. You don't want to do that. Level number two, what you're graduating into, is your sales then go into an LLC account and then the owner takes a draw from that account. Level number three, which is really essentially this get up right here, sales go into the LLC. LLC money goes into the S Corp or that holding company, and then the owner can draw that salary and the distributions from that, and those are taxed differently. So lots of different business tax strategies once you have one and anybody can really own a business. Anybody can start their own business. So these are just a few strategies to do. You can just start off doing a YouTube channel like I do or making something um, out in your garage and selling it to people, having some income that way. There's lots of different ways, lots of different things that you may be doing as an individual to bring in money which could be considered a business, and then you can set up your business, an LLC, you just have to go through your state. Usually it doesn't cost very much at all. Uh, mine initially had cost, I believe, about $200. I, I'm nearly positive it was under that, but $200 tops to set up my LLC, and the renewal fees are very cheap on it. So it's easy to set up a business. Uh, it's it's really not very hard. It does not take that much time. A couple weeks, I believe, is, is what it came down to for me when I was setting it up. But pretty easy to do. You just have to find that thing that, that you're probably already doing, what your expertise or what your niche is, and start capitalizing on that and create a business around it. Investment tips. For properties, uh, most countries actually have pretty much the same tax laws, apparently, um, which it talks about in that book a lot. But uh, in many countries, you can completely avoid paying taxes on the gain of the sale of your property if you buy another uh, like property. So if you buy another property that's more than the property that you just sold, then you don't have to pay the taxes on that because you're doing a like kind exchange. So the taxes you would end up paying if you if that second property that you purchased, if you sold it, you would have to pay taxes on that property. But you're only paying taxes on that property. You're not paying taxes on both of the properties, both the, the first one that you had that you did the like kind exchange for and the second one, you're only doing it in the final property that you did that you don't end up doing another like kind exchange for. So very easy way to uh, save on money and, and be a real estate investor. Very easy way to save on taxes, but still get lots of money for, your, uh, for the efforts for maybe doing your remodeling or whatnot and flipping the house. If you do that, they're like kind exchange then you don't have to pay the taxes on the money that you made on it. You just shovel it over into the next one. And then you have a bunch of money that's available right off the bat to throw into that next house that you're going to work on. And then you can just keep on flipping them that way. Uh, if you don't, then you have to pay capital gains. Uh, so in most cases, if you don't have your house or don't, if you haven't lived in your house as a primary resident for over two years, then you have to pay capital gains tax on it, which is a hefty amount. But that is one way of um, getting around that legally and, and saving money there. So for stocks, again, talking about capital gains, if you're not sure what, the, what that is, then it's what's so capital and long term. I would really advise that you go look into it, especially if you're interested in investing. Please get an understanding of what those are. If you want to do stock investing as opposed to real estate, then stock investing is taxed at capital gains. Unlike mutual fund uh, gains, you only have to pay tax on them when you sell them for, for stocks. Mutual funds, uh, how it works is because you're buying into a fund with a bunch of other people that are in it, the mutual fund owners who are buying all the stocks, those guys 
So when they buy and sell stocks for the portfolio for you, and you should be making money overall, but the people who are running it, the people who are doing the individual buys and sells, they are not paying taxes on the selling for the gains or losses of those individual stocks within the mutual fund. You, as the person who are actually owning the individual stocks within the fund, you are the one who is being taxed with those. So um, a lot of people advise for mutual funds that they're really good, they balance out your prof uh, portfolio and give good diversity, but there's also a lot of people who don't agree with mutual funds because you are the one being taxed, not the company running it. So there's that. Uh, you can only lower, you only get the lower tax rate when you have a long-term capital gain, which is owing a stock owning a stock over a year. Losses from the sale of a stock are normally considered to be capital losses, which is good for you. So if you take a capital loss on your stocks, uh, so if you do lots of stock trading and you end up making a few thousand dollars, we'll, we'll just say a thousand dollars off of stock trading for the year, uh, but come the end of the year, you see this one stock sitting in your portfolio and it has lost quite a bit of money. Well, you already know that you're going to be paying uh, capital gains tax on that thousand dollars. So what you can do is sell the stock that has lost you money, whatever that money is that you've lost on it, which is your capital loss. Say it's $500 you lost on that one stock. That $500 comes off of that thousand in gains. So now you only have to pay taxes on the $500 gains instead of the thousand because you deducted 500 in capital losses, if that makes sense. US also uh, tax dividends from stocks at the lower capital gains tax rates. Um, that's where I prefer to do my investing is with dividends. Uh, because I generally own them over a year and then uh, it's a lower tax rate as well for the dividends. Mutual funds, you may unknowingly pay taxes on gains to the fund even if you only own for one day. This is what I was talking about. Income earned in a mutual fund is not taxed to the mutual fund. Instead, it's taxed to the investors, to you, the person who are actually owning the stocks. Next section here is FIRE, Financial Independence Retire Early. Two sections here that I want to cover is dividend income and then buying real estate. So the key tenants of FIRE that's right here, live below your means and less money than you make, essentially. Save and invest as much money as possible. So any of that extra that you saved, invest it as much as you can look for other income sources passive income is primary that that is generally looked at here and think about and start planning for your retirement now and that's from uh, money wise right there and the link is also right down here so move into this next one for dividend income this information is coming from andre jick as you can see right here and that's a link to his channel. He's a really good person to follow, already a millionaire, but he came from almost nothing. He shares his entire journey, what his portfolio is, um, his thoughts on different types of investments. It's a very good channel uh, to follow. Uh, Graham Stephan is another one. We also have right here, Joseph Hogg. So, uh, he was a prior military individual and goes and he's now a financial advisor and so he's a CFA right there a link to his stuff there um, So if you do dividend investing, which I do I have my own tracker I don't actually use this one, but this is one that you can get from uh, Andre Jick That's an example of a tracker that you can use and Joseph Hogg in one of his videos He does lots of these uh, and pretty much every year for different stocks as they change but uh, Both of these two items here are from Joseph Hogg and he's just showing that um to get a monthly dividend portfolio. So every single month he gets paid stocks or he gets paid dividends for the stocks that he owns. Uh, and that's how I run my portfolio. And I have 
most of these, not quite all of them. But this has the payout schedule for, for each of them. So for the ticker symbol F, which is Ford Motor, um, it has the dividend yield at the time that he made this video and then the months that are paid out. Generally, those months do not change at all. Usually, the only time they don't pay out is like during a recession or whatnot. But if you choose the right ones, even like the kind of the, the recession or the crash there that we had with COVID, uh, a lot of companies stopped paying dividends, but a lot of the blue chip ones essentially did not stop paying. They may have lowered a little bit, but, but a lot of them didn't stop paying. So if you invest in really good quality companies, then you can continue to get a, a dividend investment. So even if your stock goes down, that doesn't matter. You're still getting the dividend that you're still getting the dividends from your initial investment and it doesn't matter what the current recession may look like. So over here, based off of those same stocks and that same monthly payout, um, he says he has a hundred thousand dollars portfolio using those seven stocks that are right there. And so this is his monthly payout on a hundred thousand dollar portfolio. Uh, so it shows all of that breakdown there. So for the first six months, he made two thousand two hundred thirty-five and seventy-one cents, and then for that second six months or the end of the year, uh, two thousand two hundred thirty-five seventy-one also. And so that's just monthly breakdowns, uh, and that's showing that if if you buy each one of those stocks, then you'll have a monthly payout on it. So. Uh, and that's passive income right there. You, you buy the initial stocks and then just let it sit. Do not look at them again. Uh, that's where a lot of especially new investors or people who, who want to make money real quick, you know, those get rich quick schemes, which sometimes they work, but most of the time they do not. And that is nothing that I would ever recommend to you uh, to do is, is to look for a get rich quick scheme. Uh, I have some experience with, with some of those early on when, you know, I was, uh, when I was overdrafting every single pay period when I was a junior uh, a sergeant at that time, E5, and I looked into some of those and it did not play out well for me. So, I, you know, sometimes you may win with that, but in general, you're not going to. So at this point, I stick with the long game. I buy the initial stocks and then I just leave it. I don't look at them again. I have no plans of ever selling those stocks, maybe unless it's for a capital loss, but only because it's a loss, I'm not trying to sell them for gains. I am using it as passive monthly income to create an income. Um, right now I'm using Robinhood and I just reinvest those. I use the drip system, so dividend reinvestment program. And any of the dividend income that I get is just immediately reinvested back into the exact same stocks that paid it out. So it keeps on recycling itself and just building my portfolio every month. So mine isn't near this size here, but uh, working to that at some point. All right, and then this last one here uh, in this particular section is real estate and then we'll go into the Burr method which is part of this real estate uh, portion here. Single family homes, my recommendation is that you purchase only if you have the means to improve or plans for renting that home. I personally um, have done this. I, I usually, when I have um, the option to, and know the length of stay that I'm going to be at the duty station, I will buy a single family home. I will do a bunch of home improvements while I live there for a minimum of two years, which is a huge dividing, uh, deciding factor. If I know that I'm gonna be there at only two years or less, I will not buy. I will uh, just rent from the military or rent from the community there. So a uh, big reason why is if you don't live in that house for two years, as your primary home, then you have to pay capital gains on that and you'll end up actually losing a lot of money if you try and sell before the two year mark if you haven't uh, if you haven't really increased the equity in your home. So I only advise this one in those two circumstances. If you have the means to improve it and increase the equity overall cost for it. Or if you have plans for renting it out 
uh, at least until that point where you've passed that two years and, and can pass on a so you can get a lower tax rate on the sale for it. Multifamily homes would be my recommendation and the first opportunity that I have, I will go for multifamily homes. Uh, another downside to single family homes is it can take a very long time, well, for both of these, to evict somebody if they're not paying and if they're not living in there uh, according to the contract, it can take a very long time to evict somebody. So if you have a single family home where this is your only source of income and you still have to pay that mortgage no matter what, then you're, you're really going to be sucking if you have issues with this one person. If you have a multifamily home, then it can be safer, generate more income, and allow you to live expense-free from your mortgage. You could actually live in one of them. Uh, so if you say you had um, a triplex, then you live in one, rent out the other two, and those other two can be paying the mortgage for you. So you can be living in there mortgage-free. Uh, you can still be paying an or a mortgage overall, but just for you to be living in that one home in there, be really free for you. Uh, also, in this case that somebody messes up and you, and you do have to charge them or whatnot, and you're having to evict them, and if you're not getting that money, you still have other homes in the building, especially if you don't live in the building, then you still have other homes that are paying for uh, that mortgage overall for the building, so it's much safer there. Many of these investors that do this still follow the uh, Burr method to increase their portfolio. And here is what the Burr method is. The Burr method. Buy is the is the B there. So get a great deal on a rental on a property that you want to rent, not not a rental that you're getting, but on a property that you want to rent. First R is repair, fix it up. Do whatever you need to increase the value of that property. Three, rent it out to some really good tenants. Make sure you do your research. Have a good um, have a good company that can watch over the home if you're not there and readily available. Property manager. Next one is refinance it. Get a new loan that covers the purchase price plus the repairs. So the overall value of the property that has went up. Refinance it get that cash out loan, and then you can use that to repeat the process. So with the value of your home being higher, you refinance it, get that cash out, and now you can use that cash that you had gotten, cash out refinance on the home that you just fixed up, and then go buy another one with the cash that you have in hand. And so you can just keep on doing that over and over and over again until you have several different homes in your portfolio and then you have a lot more income that is really readily available to you. So Burr method is uh, very common. There's lots of different ways. If you look up the Burr method and how people do it, I'm also part of a, a Facebook group that goes over this as well. And there's lots of people who talk about being able to do, uh, do this process without using any of their own money. So they're, they're collecting lots of money from the income of renting it out and whatnot, but the initial process of buying it and everything um, isn't using any of their own money and very clever process there. So that pretty much wraps up that portion of the basic education that I can give. It's a lot of information that is super quick and usually when I'm doing this, um, class in with my ncos there's just tons and tons of questions the whole way so uh, drop them in the comments and i will try and answer them as soon as i can if anybody else is watching this and and has answers to that uh please go ahead and give it but please be intelligent with the answers that you're giving if you are going to do that if you're not a financial advisor i would very much prefer if you would disclose that, just like I am not a financial advisor. So anything that I tell you is just my personal experience and is not something that I'm advising you to do. Um, it is just my personal experience and observations of, of things that I have seen or done. So we will close this up with my recommendations. My recommendations here, um, so these are just some different areas that, that I would advise you look into. I'm not going to go over what my breakdown is or anything like that because I'm not a financial advisor, but I would recommend that you look into this stuff. 
So Roth IRA, if you don't know what that is, if you don't know the difference between a Roth IRA and a traditional IRA and how taxes are paid on those, I recommend a Roth IRA over a traditional savings account is something worth looking into. It can really help out in medical emergencies in the military. Pretty much, oh, we're pretty fortunate there where insurance covers pretty much anything that we do. Uh, but you have family members where the insurance doesn't fully cover them and everything that they do. Uh, extended family or anybody in this, uh, anybody watching this who isn't in the military and doesn't have that same insurance coverage for medical, look into the health savings account. You can put money in there. There's a lot of tax advantages for it. Uh, if you put your money in there, you can draw that. It's, uh, it has a high yield from my understanding and compounds really well. And if you pull money from that account to help with, say, a dental visit like orthodontics, right? Um, because that generally isn't covered in all insurances, in all insurance companies. Uh, if you pull that money for something medical, then it won't be taxed coming out. Um, and then you can also borrow against that money as well. So health savings accounts have a lot of benefits that a lot of people don't know about. So I would look into that uh, if you have the chance. Stocks, um, I advise spreading your, your wealth to diversify your accounts across a lot of these different areas. So stocks, bonds, real estate. Uh, Acorns is an app that I use for investing, cryptocurrency, and then cash equivalents. Those are some different ways that you can diversify your accounts. Some different books that I would really recommend you read are all these ones in this, in this white box down here, Tax-Free Wealth. That is where 99% of the information in this presentation came from was what I had originally learned from Tax-Free Wealth book. Rich Dad, Poor Dad series, they have a ton of books uh, that fall under that series. They're really good. Cashflow Quadrants is a book that really helps you understand where the government gives exemptions and deductions to different business and stuff. That is how a lot of very wealthy individuals determine what they want to invest their money in. They invest their money in areas that the government allows the most exemptions and deductions in, which means that they can make the most money in that area and have to pay the least amount of taxes for, for that type of investment whatever it may be. So cash flow quadrants really helps you understand that. Money Master the Game, I Will Teach You to Be Rich, Little Book of Common Sense, Think and Grow Rich. Those four books really are mindset books. If uh, helping you understand the mindset that is required to become wealthy. And these other two right here, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and and five love languages, really good ones, uh, different ways uh, to establish habits that will help you become successful, ultimately change your mindset, and, and within that success, then you can start aiming that to whatever you want success in. Uh, but that helps you, helps you uh, solve that. And then five love languages, even if you're not in a relationship, I know this is really funny and my guys usually laugh at this quite a bit, but even if you're not in a relationship, if you are in a leadership position at all, or if you're going to be a business manager and you have people uh, working under you or even your customers, to understand these five love languages here and understand the perspectives of other people, if you can understand what drives somebody, what makes them feel loved, that's a, that is what is important to them. So if you can understand what drives them and what makes them feel loved, and you can work around that when you're dealing in your interpersonal, building your interpersonal relationship with uh, the people that you work with, the people that work for you, or the customers that you're trying to bring in, if you can understand that piece and appeal to it, then you're going to be a much more effective leader, business owner, whatever it may be, anything that you're trying to do, whether you're trying to build networks, you're going to be much more effective in that role if you understand that piece of it. So those are just some books that I recommend you read, some different areas that I recommend that you research uh, and possibly invest in if, if you 
find them uh, appropriate for your scenario, your case. But if you have any questions, please let me know. I will do my absolute best to answer them within the, the knowledge that I have. But again, disclaiming that I am not a financial advisor. So uh, hopefully this helps out and you can you guys and you guys can use this as an NCOPD uh, with your own guys whenever you need. Please pass this along to other uh, people. Subscribe so that you can get these updates. Uh, you'll see on this channel, there's a lot of TikTok videos that I do about trying to, you know, be the change within an organization. We're stronger together, working together, and how we can change the culture of the Army to be more beneficial to all of us as leaders, uh, subordinates or followers, juniors, seniors, whatever position uh, or role you might fulfill within the military, that is what that channel is, is really developed. Or, that's what that channel is about, is trying to drive that change in culture and then these NCOPD topics here. So you can visit our website at thesoldierspot.com and that has links to all of our different accounts. We have uh, the TikTok account as well. We have this YouTube channel. So lots of different researches, resources for you. Uh, any of the information and knowledge that I have, I'm trying to pass along to you guys so you can be more successful than I ever am uh, than I ever was or probably ever will be, uh, but just trying to pass that along. So I hope that you guys got some good information from this and can share it with others. Please subscribe if you can and have a great day.